Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop today. A treat especial industrial Lego. People say love make the world go around. Other people say money make the world go around. We know that three phase induction motors make the world go around. We're gonna have a nook at the lane plate because uh, off neglected and yet very powerful is knowing what the fuck you're looking at. And the name plate, this was uh, devised by uh, NEMA, which is a trading association. Back in the 20s, all, they all got together and figured out a way to keep the little guys from uh, chewing into their market share by having a, an old boys club. But uh, on the auspices of standardization. And standardization, as the Germans will tell you, is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Especially when it comes to you and I. It, you don't need to think about stuff. You look at the nameplate and it's a jelly bean part. You get it from anywhere what has that NEMA rating and in, in the UK uh, or continental types it's IEC so whether it's a metric motor or uh, a NEMA motor the nameplate is essentially the same and you will be able to get from this frame size and the specifications the exact th same thing from another manufacturer it's what they call in electronics a jelly bean part just means they're interchangeable they're easy to procure Boulder Made in America, Fort Smith, Arkansas. Uh, sold to ABB in the early 2000s for five or four billion dollars. Of course, this is the god uh, Odin's son. What could not, nothing on earth. His mother made everything on earth promise that they would not hurt Baldor. Of course, a PDO complex being what it is, uh, that was his downfall because his brother Loki found out about his one weakness to mistletoe and uh, the boys, the lads were all <laughs> gathered around throwing shit at Balder because why not? Hold my beer. This, <laughs> nothing hurts me. And uh, he made an arrow out of mistletoe and uh, passed it off to uh, a, a sh uh, another schlub and threw it at Balder and killed him. Dead. Killed him right dead. So his mother's best wishes. That's the thing. I will always protect you, but you can never grow up. There's a whole lot of that going on in uh, North American society nowadays. I will always protect you from everything that is bad in the world, but you can never grow up. There's, there's a bargain there, and it's, it's not fucking good, partner. It's not good. If you're 30 years old and living in your mother's basement, you want to take a good hard look at uh, what's going on there because there is a vile bargain. Anyway, I digress. So, <laughs> frame. A frame size uh, 56 so that's that's essentially by knowing that 56 and it's not a C face so there would be a C there that would be flange mount so we know this is foot mounted that gives us we can look that up partner and that gives us the shaft length the shaft girth the keyway size how much all sorts of stuff it, it's fucking amazing you just know that frame size and you can just about spec the motor out now moving on down here horsepower one half horsepower dp no idea volts 208 to 230 and 460 this is a dual voltage motor depending on and look at that isn't that convenient they show you a wiring schematic depending on how you wire it up you can have it at 280 volts or 208 the beauty about this is any kind of uh, electrical implement is plus minus 10 percent voltage so like an Arduino, plus minus 10%. It'll run on five volts, it'll run on 5.5, it'll run on 4.5, no problem. This thing, so you wire it up and it's uh, 440 volts, not a problem, plus minus 10%, no problem at all. That's a good rule of thumb, what for in former days you'd be allowed to beat your wife with, but uh, luckily we're, <laughs> we're well past that. I still use that and uh, get called out for using that vile you know, but it, yeah, anyway, I digress. So amps here, 2.1 and then at twice the voltage, no surprise, one amp. So that is not a whole lot of angry pixies to get a half a horsepower, one, one amp, that's fuck all. You can piss more current than that. The problem is getting that pressure up, that's <laughs> 480 volts, not quite. Ripums, of course, it's always generally uh, 1725 or twice that, just depending on the amount of poles in the motor hurts so good 60 hertz it'll run five on it'll run just fine on 50 but it's designed for 60 that means you can also run this off a variable frequency drive 
uh, it doesn't have the same it's it's not made for it so it won't last as long and it won't have the same torque characteristics as a as an inverter duty but at the same time just for shits and giggles in the shop we can run this off a variable frequency drive no problemo service factor we're getting into some technical stuff this is essentially the skookumness factor 1.25 allows you so this would be able to run at uh, 0.66 so three uh, no two-thirds of a horsepower uh, no problem at all the only thing is it doesn't it won't necessarily have the torque to start something that while it's running draws uh, two-thirds of a horsepower so this service factor is essentially how much horsepower this thing will put out no problem for a defined amount of time for a short period of time class b so what that means is the insulation class and that is i believe uh 150 degrees centigrade there's class f as well which is hotter and class h which is hotter still insulation you have to consider in a three-phase induction motor the insulation is a wearing item it has a defined lifetime so say this was spec to uh 20,000 hours which is 2.25 uh, years if you go 10 degrees C, 10 degrees C over that B rating, which is 150, something like that. So say you ran this at uh, 160 C, that would mean that this thing would only last one year. So for every 10 degrees science above this rated, the insulation uh, halves its lifetime. So you look at that now if this is in a real hot environment a blower or something on some sort of furnace and you're replacing this every three months you got to look at the cooling because that's exactly what's happening the hotter it is it'll run just fine but the lifetime drops dramatically as the temperature increases now we're looking at full load efficiency of 74 percent not tea bag, not great, of course, but small motors are notoriously inefficient and they also have horrible power factors as witnessed here, 6.5%. Now, we're gonna get into power factor just very quickly, quick and dirty, because you could spend a month of Sundays with, with the peanuts teacher uh, talking at you about power factor. Just very quickly, we're gonna go over it. I'm gonna to explain to you so you know it's just a little bit beyond uh, just fucking magic. We'll get into it. This induction motor, no surprise, it's right in the name, is an inductor. An inductor resists change to current. A capacitor resists change to voltage. So this resists change to current. Now recall, we're putting AC in here. So what happens? is we have the AC voltage doing this, the current is always lagging that, always lagging, because it's trying to catch up. The power factor is the difference between these two peaks, okay? The how much it's lagging. Now put another way, take the third, eschewing obfuscation through technical minutia, we just wanna get right down to the crux to the matter of power factor. Now. Efficiency is how much actual power we're putting in and how much we're getting out of the shaft. We get 75% of that according to the nameplate. Whatever we put in electrically, we get 75% out the dingus end here. The rest is heat and windage losses, trying to get rid of that heat, the hysteresis and so forth. So now the power factor is completely different than the efficiency. What the power factor is, is we take the nameplate. It's it's real power versus apparent power. So we take the nameplate here and we go 480 volts times the amps. That gives us 480 VA, volts, amps. That is apparent power. That is what the utility needs to provide. They need the infrastructure to provide that much apparent power. But they only they're metering actual wattage so the lower the power factor the higher their cost because they need to provide more equipment to supply this demand but they're only charging you for 63 percent of that 
whatever the power factor is. Looking at it another way, we draw a diagram here. We take that VA, put that on a hypotenuse, and we put the real power, which is 63% of that, on the adjacent. In English would be uh, adjacent. And then on the opposite, we have uh, reactive power. We don't need to worry about that, but that's uh, VA reactive. Essentially, that's what is getting turned into battery power. Remember, the inductor uh, stores power. So that's this power. We don't need to worry about that. We just need to understand that the actual watts going in here are 63% of this nameplate uh, at full load. It uh, changes too, at full load. So that would be what? Let's say 400 watts we get out of that. And half horsepower, half of 747, right around 400, say 350 watts. That's the, that, that's the power factor. It's the difference. It's actually watts over K or over VA. Actual power over the apparent power. And the, the, the reason that that's important is because if your power factor in your whole facility is too low, that means that the, the, the electrical utility has to provide for a whole lot of this apparent power, but it's only charging the factory for the actual power used. So they ding you if your power factor is too low. They, they, they fine you. They want it to be as close as possible because they got to get their pound of flesh out of you. That is power factor. Now, as a general rule, the smaller the motor, the worse the power factor. Now, why did you draw this? Why did we draw this in a triangle? It's just two values. Ah, because the mass of the ass here depends on the angle of the dangle. The bigger this motor is, the better the power factor in general. But this angulation here between the hypotenuse, which is apparent, and the adjacent, whatever the fuck you say in English, which is uh, actual watts, that hangulation, that's the lag. That's the lag of the angle. <laughs> it all comes together. Oh, look at that, there we go. Boop, boop, boop. Blew your mind? Yeah, blew something. First things first, when you're looking at an unknown, you use your uncommon sense, <laughs> your five senses. It's quickly, common sense is not common sense anymore. It's, it's uncommon sense. Does this thing spin him a thing? Does it smell burnt? Is it rattling around? Is stuff loose, stuff cracked? Uh, you know, all the typical stuff. If it, if it smells like shit, looks like shit, tastes like shit, spit it the fuck out. Now that we know, it seems okay. A little bit growly on the tail end bearing, maybe, but no detents to speak of. Nothing, you know, real, real chunky. So maybe it's just a, a squealy motor we might be able to fix that. Now what we're gonna do is get into the electrical side and test very quickly to see if this is a viable option to, to plug in. You know, we don't wanna let the smoke out, especially not at 480 volts. Now having a wee boo at this, we can tell that this was set up for the high voltage, so 480. So these are your three input phases here. These are your three guys here. And what we're gonna do is just very quickly do a resistance check to make sure that they are all similar resistance. Phase to phase, we're looking at 37 ohms, close 32 ohms, and then this guy, 32 ohms. Okay, so there's one that's a little bit higher resistance, might have got cooked. 32, let's just double check that. Sometimes your leads are off a little bit. Okay, well that, my leads must have been off. Yeah, they're all the same, perfect. Now, we check phase to ground. And we see we're in the mega ohms. I happen to have a mega here, which is a mega ohm meter. What we do is we put these under very high voltage and we check for leakage. And that is, is, that is confirming the status or the condition of the insulation of each individual winding. Now let's just keep this between you and I. Don't tell my dear sweet wife. Suffice it to say, the next time I go on a road trip, she ain't gonna be too happy. I just gotta jam these in the mega. 
Some makers run on little double A's. <laughs> Not mine, and neither does hers. Blast from the past a decade gone by. This was the cheapest mega that would do 10 kV. And uh, I have very little to say about it other than it is the cheapest mega that will do 10 kV. The old Empire, she's a demanding mistress, seems to have swallowed up my test lead end there. So use Hazard Fraud's finest. I got to check in these, always check them because a lot of them are dead right from the factory. Okay, so you have continuity there. Uh, we'll stick this on here. You should be rated, oh, definitely rated for 10,000 volts. <laughs> uh, stay the fuck away. At least we'll leave a beautiful corpse. Now, the deal is, when you're doing an ohm check with a multimeter, it outputs 1.5 volts, checks to see how many milliamps are coming back, or microamps, and that tells you the resistance. But in this case, for the mega, we put out, instead of 1.5 volts, we're putting out 10,500 volts, whatever. So this is 480, um, depending on, well, there's no, hard, there's no hard and fast rule, but we're gonna bring it up to 1,000 volts, which is double the voltage. Shouldn't uh, damage any insulation. If this was an industrial uh, thing, we could go even higher. But there's going to be a protocol involved and so forth. So we'll just go at 1,000 volts. We'll see what the resistance do. Uh, we're good. Everything's in place. Let's start the test. Connect leads and press test. So we are at 1,000 volts. And it's checking. So 775 mega ohms. Uh, 800 mega ohms. So that is good. Now we're at zero volts. So we'll st it's holding and we'll stop the test. That was the one lead. We can try all the other leads, but we know that they're good as well because they're connected in series by 32 ohms, which we checked earlier. So we really only need to check the one. And that's that's to ground, mind. That's phase to ground. So this thing, perfectly good insulation. And for tits and pickles, because we can, we're gonna bring her up to 10 times rated root mean square voltage. This is in DC, so this will, hey, this will damage the insulation to some extent because there's a the static, well, it's a capacitive static charge on there and they wanna break through the, the dielectric layer and so forth. So not recommended however fun contact connect the leads and test this is 5000 volts and oh here's some clicking and clack in there so it is making yeah absolutely we're starting to get the oxygen turning into ozone that's what high voltage does. And then depending on the path, if the path is real short, it will flash over. But it hasn't flashed over and we're good. We're showing a lot of mega ohms. So we stop the test, turn it off. Everybody's happy, happy. This is a good motor. Now what's that green? It's not ground, it's actually the guard. Uh, this, this device is for testing uh, high voltage trailing cables for mining equipment and you know drag lines and this sort of thing so the guard actually goes on the interior uh, insulation to minimize any surface leakage path you get better readings so we just I put it on the uh, I put it on the conductors there uh, on the insulation on the conductors and now we've tried it again and we're reading uh, 5,000 mega ohms so so does that make any fucking difference at all? Eh, not really. It's it's one of those things. You're either pregnant or you're not. It's either good or it's not. And at these levels, it is plenty good. I know she's electrically sound as the pound. We'll get into the meat of her. These big long screws are kind of a pain in the cunning linguals to get back in because well, what are these? 10, 1024s, 1032s. Uh, 1032s looks like. Tiny and yeah, super, super long. 
So that's why these rolled, like these rolled bodies are the cheapest available. It's just a piece of tube steel that's been rolled. It's not a totally enclosed fan cooled, you know, like an industrial with the big fins and all that sort of stuff. So this is very much almost what you call like a farm duty or just, I'm sure you could buy this from the hazard fraud, the same exact motor other than not being made in America. Tappy tap tap. The 2.2 pound smart persuader says so right on the sticker. She does not want to come. Meeting the town square with the pickaxes. That's absolutely last, last resort. So, uh, yeah, yeah, not good. But now, anyway, we, we got enough we can sort of get a fox wedge in there and prize her apart. Kind of sort of getting there, teasing her. Oh, there. <laughs> just one look at the bars, <laughs> loosened right up. Got scared. Okay, not so tough now, are you, fucker? So that is nicely corroded and that was, uh, well that's just surface rust. This was outside clearly. There are very few moving parts in this and because we know she sound electrically, it's got to be one of the moving parts why this got, yeah. There we go. Nasty, nasty bearing. Probably corroded. No grease at all. So that is the problem with this motor. One little bearing. It's a 6208 DU. So that DU designation must be, uh, a seal high um, lots of room for it to grow in the heat we'll take that out and we'll have a look at the bearing see what actually happened do some failure analysis and at the same time we'll do a bit of research on the this is a whole trade motor rewinding motor rebuilding like this it's you know guys do this their entire working lives like there's, there's a lot to this and I'm no expert on rewinding um, windings so I'm going to go and have a look at that and then we'll also uh, have a look see if we can't get one or two new bearings while we're in there might as well do both cheap like borscht the bearings were coming from Mao's Dollarama Poundland on a coal fired junk so we'll see if they're uh, any fucking good at all when they get here if not we'll, we'll buy the proper brand but cheap like borscht now this we can tell from the construction is a very cheaply made motor it is a base base model small horsepower fractional horsepower very cheaply made here in this in the uh squirrel the the uh rotor you can see normally these would be offset a little bit that is to well we see that in the power factor so these are the actual conductors there's no wires in here these guys these these cast aluminium conductors these are the conductors and they create eddy currents and that's what counteracts the uh, the magnetic field in here that's rotating and, and makes this spin around so normally we would see these on a hangulation this is just straight laminated uh, silicon steel high permeability silicon steel and yes yeah, super cheap I don't see any balancing whatsoever so this would be cast in place this aluminium is the conductor and then just hollowed out in the center for uh, lower weight essentially because it's, it's not necessary and the windings themselves same thing silicon steel thin laminations and then in with some transformer tape or some fish paper and then wound around real small but dipped and then all tied together so nice and sturdy and then it appears to be epoxied in to the body of um, well you see how thin that is a very very cheaply made motor uh, we can see it it didn't last now referring to the nameplate there is nothing indicating whether this is a Y or a Delta wound rotor however a small motor you know we're not talking anything fancy from Germany five pole step uh, nothing DC induction nothing nothing like that nothing fancy bog standard motor squirrel cage induction it's gonna be Y it's gonna be a Y wound so how is it possible that we can get two different voltages through this and it still works 
I'll show you with a diagram. So if it doesn't say on, it's pretty safe to assume it's a Y. So instead of a delta, if it says delta, it'll be delta, obviously. Some older motors, they've gone tits up uh, Westinghouse. I think they're now Tico. But um, <laughs> some bean counter decided it would be cheaper to just have one tag and they showed delta and Y connections. And you'd, yeah, it was just a fucking nightmare. So good riddance to bad rubbish. But here we go on the delta, boop, boop, boop. on the delta, it, a delta is a triangle, so we'd have something like that. But on the Y, what we have is we have two windings in series, like so, in a Y configuration. And then the power goes in here, and then if we want high voltage, we go through here, because now look, we're going through two of these inductors. That allows us to run higher voltage. What happens if we want to run lower voltage? What we do is instead of putting these in series, we put them in parallel and we get twice the amperage, but lower uh, Z, lower uh, inductive, no, uh, impedance, lower impedance. So that's all it is. It's a Y connection. And if we put these in series, we can go high voltage. If we put these in parallel, we can go low voltage. Point of order, I either gleaned over this or pulled a Mr. Bean mist up here, put the turkey on my head. This, <laughs> this class B, could be either the insulation, I'm not entirely sure, or the construction of the rotor. Different classes, uh, different horses for different courses, you can have higher st startup torque. Excuse me, <coughs> I get all choked up here. <coughs> and um, this DES, that might actually be the insulation. So insulation code uh, B, 130C. I think I said 150, but I was, uh, you know, I thought I was wrong. It turns out I was mistaken. This, this class B, po quite possibly, is the type of rotor in here. And depending if you want high startup torque or if you want low power factor or, you know, whatever kind of flavor you're looking for, they can change that. Being as it is that we don't want to destroy the bearing, I'm going to show you a trick here. I showed you this before, but not with this particular material. This is good for cases and cases of beer, especially if you're an electrician. And... Uh, your coworkers would have never heard of this in a million years. So go ahead and harvest all the beers you can handle. Plain old white bread, in this case sourdough, seems to last longer here without going bad. And a little tappy tap tap. We are using the white bread as a hydraulic fluid. to hydraulically push the bearing out of its seat. Cheddar! Now a lot of times you don't have bread in the shop unless you're raiding somebody else's lunch, but grease and uh, grease and rags work just fine. Here we got the preload here, just a, just a wave spring and then a little washer. And there she is. Stiff as can be. Let's have a look, see. Classic lucibricity failure here. Got overheated and cooked the grease out of her and then the balls and the race failed. Now, if and we had to have a real close, perfect look at the inner and outer race and the balls, we could, at, at the race, drill those uh, rivets out and then take that apart, put all the balls to one side and lift it lift it up and pull it out, but we're not too worried about that, so we're just gonna zip cut it. Well, the balls look pretty good. Race is intact, and they're nice and shiny. No dull marks at all, and no chunks taken out of them. Balls, good. Inner race, nothing wrong with it, really. Don't see any indications of wear, excessive fatigue, no brunelling, no false brunelling, nothing like that. Looks good on the inner race. Outer race. One half of it looks great. You can see where the ball has actually been been uh, under load here. So up against the back side. Of course, when you compress the thing together, uh, it loads the balls on one side. And we can see that in some slight patterning here. Where is it? Right around here somewhere. 
Uh, it's tough to see on the camera if I get it up to my but yeah right up right up in here if you look at the, yeah you can see it there you see it's looking kind of spotty so that's pretty normal for a well used bearing and we look at the other half and this is where the failure actually occurred same thing same orientation where the balls are loaded what we get here is a fatigue failure right in here started right here this little clip and we get conchoidal benchmarking as the ball comes up and over that lip that was just created from the pit and then continues on and this would have if they ran it longer would have continued right along the periphery of the outer race so we know that the outer race got damaged due to lack of lubrication and ended up getting fatigued. I hope that was an interesting and edifying little trip down industrial Lego lane. Squirrel cage induction motors, not much to it. Not very many moving parts until you scratch the surface and you start getting into the whys and the wherefores. And they're pretty fucking smart, man. There's a lot going on under the paint. Thanks for watching. Keep your dick in a vice.